And if you don't know me, my name is Anna. I'm the executive pastor here. And I get to lead alongside my husband and an amazing team of people. And I'm just grateful that I get to be here. Um, I This this is a, um, a new series we kicked off. And it is not an easy series. Who wants to talk about the times they've been offended and, you know, what God says about them. Because, y'all, I did not know that the Word talks so much about offenses, literally the word offenses and and why, right? So we're going to dig into that today. Last week we kicked it off, Pastor Matthew kicked it off, and really talked about what is this offense and where do these offenses come from. And today we're going to just dig in a little bit deeper into uh, this thing called an offense that we almost so lightly take on in our life. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take out your bulletins or your journals, your Bibles, because uh, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. We want to make sure that we remember, jot down the things that God is prompting you. Um, what is he leading you uh, maybe to take action on after you leave here? Uh, things that he just brings to your mind, and it might be way beyond what I'm speaking. It's just what he is depositing into your mind as we speak. Um, before we continue, let's pray. I'm going to ask that Uh, You just join me in prayer. I'm going to pray that God would just allow me to filter my words through him. And if you would just take some time and pray that God would just make sure this is the right message, right? No, God's God's got me. Father, thank you so much. You are so good. And God, I just thank you for this journey that you have us on. Um, I pray that uh, through today's message, you would filter my words, that they would be your words that are spoken. And Father, I pray that freedom would take place for people today because that's what you do. And so, Father, I just thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you uh, for what you're already doing, what you've already started in this house. Father, I stand behind you. Father, and I ask that you lead the way through this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, y'all, so um, um, there was, I'm going to share something, and hopefully I don't, like, just gag right here in front of you, but um, some, a couple years ago, I want to say, um, I heard Matthew yell, you know when someone yells your name and you, like, know something's not right, and he's standing in the uh, laundry room, and we had plenty of laundry room into garage experiences in our house, there have been, like, birds in our house because they, like, came in and, like, made a nest, but this time I'm, like, he's, like, literally, like, you know, we're prop the door open, like, do not open the door. And he's like, babe, I'm like, what? He's like, I saw something move in the garage. I'm like, no, that's silly. He's like, babe, I think I saw the tail of a mouse. Oh, you guys, I don't do anything like that, okay? I don't do no kind of pests at all. Not even cute ones like hamsters. Don't ask me to pet sit. I don't do things like that. I don't do spiders. We have like our exterminator on like speed dial because I don't do spiders of any kind. I'm not the one that's going to pick them up and put them outside. Don't let them live, y'all. Squash them because it could be a mama spider and it could have baby spiders that are going to later float around my house. No judging, but y'all, I walk around my house at night checking the corners of my house, making sure there are no spiders because spiders could possibly mean eventually more spiders than I don't do anything like that. So when he says that, I'm like, oh my gosh. Luckily, we have a friend at the time, and he's an exterminator, and he's a good one because I was watching his Instagram stories, and he just kills all kinds of things. So I was like, y'all better call him like right now. And he calls them graciously. He comes, and he sets up these traps. And um, oh, you guys, I'm like, my stomach's turning as I'm talking about this. But he sets up these traps, and they're like, One of them is, I've never seen it like this before. It's not like the ones that, like, I saw growing up where it's like, you know, they're like the wooden ones where they just, like, now there's memes that the mouse is, like, you know, lifting weights because it can control that trap. No, it was, like, a heavyweight one. It had, like, this thick strip of something super sticky, so when it, like, lands on it, it's going to, like, die, you know, Uh, or get caught. And so um, we did that. Y'all, the mouse ate the food and didn't stick on the thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's got like superpowers. We need like a whole new kind of like thing happening in our house. Like you got to call him back because now, you know, if he doesn't take care of it, I'm mad at him because there's a mouse somehow in our house. So he calls, you know, our friend back and he's like, I got you. Don't worry. You got like some heavy duty stuff. And he comes and he sets this trap in the house. Remember when the mouse, were, I was like, so when, um, when, so the, luckily the house, mouse is not in the house. It's like on the exterior of the house, but I don't do any kind of mouse. So he uh, puts this trap in the backyard. And he says, when this mouse eats this food, it is going uh, to slowly die. And I'm like, yes. 
<laughs> as long as it dies. So the mouse is eventually going to eat the food, and slowly it's going to die. It's going insides are going to do like what it should do to any mouse, and just make it so heavy to where it paralyzes it, and it just dies. This slow death for a mouse. So here's the thing. I know I really don't like them. Um, so. Here's the thing, if the, the first time around, this mouse um, identified, obviously he's like, oh, I've seen these things before, like I'm going around, I'm just gonna grab my food and go around. It identified that it was a trap, right? The minute that you identify, the minute that I identify that something's a trap, it's no longer a trap. It is now a challenge, right? And so this second time around, when our awesome friend came and brought this heavy duty trap, this time, it was attracted to that food, it wanted it, and it died, right? And so my hope that through today is that we would be able to identify that this thing called offense, that it's not, um, that it would no longer be a trap, but that it would be a challenge, and a challenge we can take on. So I'm, my hope is that through today, we would be able to identify what those are in our life, and I'm going to dig into some scripture. We're going to go through a, quite a bit of scripture today. So make sure you write these down because when you are going to need to, like, dial 911, when someone just got you, got in on you, got under you, like, you can, you know, get it into your word. Um, and here's this scripture. It's an interesting scripture where Jesus is talking about what it's going to look like in the end of times. And Matthew shared a scripture last week, and that was 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 2 and 4. I'm going to share a different one today. And just kind of like if you felt like it wasn't enough, here's another one. And this is Jesus talking. Uh, so it's going to be red letters in your Bible. Um, and this is Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. It says, Then many will take offense, betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. In the message version, that last portion, the love of many will grow cold. It um, translates it to nothing left of their love, but a mound of ashes. Now it doesn't take a sociologist to tell us that we live in a time when there is a lot of offense taking place. If I have an opinion, you're offended. If you have an opinion, I'm offended. If we don't have an opinion, another group's offended. Oh, you mean like you're not going to post about that current event? You must not care about it. You must be for it. You must be against it. Y'all, I have to pray 20 minutes before I post anything because some of y'all going to come at me because you're offended of what I do and don't post. That's the time that we live in. And we have to be able to identify where is this coming from. And here's one thing that, the reason why I said this is an interesting scripture is because this is Jesus talking and he uses the word offense. And if we go back to what is the root word of the word that he uses here, the root word for offense here, it comes from the root word scandalon. Scandalon meaning bait of a trap. Bait of a trap. So here's what Jesus is telling us. Many are going to be trapped. People have no idea where their, why their relationships aren't working out, why their marriages are constantly broken down, um, why it is that we constantly feel like we have to find new friends. And it's because we are constantly living offended and we don't realize that we're not hurting the other person. We are trapping ourselves. Here's what I want us to understand. My hope for today is that we will see it for what it is, that we'd move from it being what it is, a trap, into that challenge. And, and there's a trap for everyone. Let's keep it real. This is not like a seasonal thing, like just during the holidays when, you know, offenses rise up. Maybe during the holidays or a time like this, things tend to spring up. Oh, I'm not going to her house. I haven't had to see her all year, and it's not going to start today because I remember last year. She straight thought she'd give me socks for Christmas. Or, you know, she thought whatever it may be, right, things will rise up. But this is a daily, sometimes by hour kind of thing where we can pick up offenses. We get offended by people on the road that cut us off, people who didn't let us in. We get offended by somebody that talked to us like a child. We get offended by someone who talks to our child like that. We get offended by our spouse who acts like a child sometimes. It's so easy to pick up offenses. 
okay, you know, I always keep it real, and I always end up just re- you know, just divulging my junk up here, and it's not going to be different today. Um, there was, um, a, I want to say it was a long time ago, Matthew happened to get sick. And y'all, he had the audacity to get sick on a week when we were busy. I was like, so, are you going to just lay there? You mean I'm going to have to like do all of these things by myself? You do remember we got four kids and all these things going on, right? I was really a little just ticked off that he wasn't doing sick right. Because like that's not how I get sick. I get sick and I still like do things. I get sick and I still like I have to, you know, I don't have to. He is really good about letting me rest. But in my personality, we just do. We just keep going. No one prepared me that men get sick different. Okay. And I just remember when we first got married, when we first got married, you guys, he got sick. It was the first time I'd, got, I'd seen him get sick. I, I couldn't see him. I couldn't find him. And I literally looked around the bed. He was crawling to the restroom because he was in such pain that he couldn't walk. And I recognized that from that moment, every time he'd get sick, I'm like, oh, Lord. (laughs) What I wasn't realizing was that my expectations of him getting sick, like he failed. He failed. My expectations of getting sick looked a little bit different. But what I was doing while I was getting offended and being so upset, he talked about these rocks, right, that we are just ready to throw people. See, I wasn't throwing any rocks because I was like, I'm just trying to be a good wife and be supportive, right? But in, internally, I wasn't necessarily throwing a rock. I was placing a rock on the floor and saying, I'm going to count this one. And now it's causing a divide between Matthew and I. Because now he feels offended. And then the next time he gets sick, I'm laying another of those rocks. I'm not saying anything to him, really. But I'm placing another rock down and now placing a greater divide. And now every time he's getting sick, he's like, Ugh, she's going to come out. <laughs> like, can I get sick? What did I do? Right? We don't realize that really what's happening when we have offenses and we create these divides between people and us, it's really creating offense. Offense creates offense, right? It creates a divide between us and that other person. And for you, it may be different. For you, it can be, um, oh, he missed my birthday. I'm not going to say anything because I'm going to pretend like I don't care. But internally, we're placing this divide now between us and that person. Oh, she didn't invite me to her party? Let me go ahead and place another one down right here because I'm not going to tell her anything. I'm going to pretend like it really didn't matter to me. But internally, I'm thinking she's not really my friend. And I'm placing that rock down. Maybe for you, it's, you know, dad, I'm actually still holding on to the fact that you left me and I'm trying to still, you know, have a dad in the picture and I'm, I, want to, I want to be good with you, but I'm really, like, I'm going to put this offense down right here. I'm not going to let you completely and we're going to put a little bit of a divide between me and you. You know, that church, last church that I went to, it hurt me, so I'm going to put this divide. And so, you know, all people who say they love Jesus must be the same. And all along, we have this invisible fence all around us created. And we don't realize that all we've done is continued to trap ourselves. You know, I have to think back, you know, when I got so offended that he had the audacity to get sick. I have to think back, like, how, after so many years of marriage, I've been married for 14 years, almost 14 years this December, um, how can I fall into that trap, right? Here is this man that I absolutely love, that I want him to feel taken care of, but I didn't even realize that I had these expectations that I had placed that are now creating a fence between him and I. And, and, but how can I fall into this trap When I know him, my heart is for him, and I love him. But see, that's just it. That's why it's a trap. Because we can't often identify where it's coming from. We just think it's normal. And I know that maybe some of you have walked through those doors and say, like, well, my offenses are a little bit bigger than someone getting sick. You know what? I think we all have some of those. And some of them, you're right, are absolutely bigger than others. And some of them are deep hurt, 
deep-rooted hurt that we have even um, begun, begun to live in a way where we've owned them or just put them behind and learned to cope with them, even trained other people how to deal with them with us, you can tell when someone is living with offense by the way that they talk, by the way that they tell their story, you can tell by the way that they talk about the way that things transpire. You can tell by the way that you can even see the hurt that is spewing from their heart, that, that hurt spewing from their heart into the way that they speak. So I, I hope that through today, as we continue that and as we dig into God's truth, um, you know, whether your hurt is big or small, uh, whether it's self-inflicted, you know, it's me setting some expectations, or or maybe someone actually causing you hurt, um, that we would be able to align our hearts to his this morning, and that we would be open to receive what he is calling us to do today. So I want to walk through some practical things. Notice I said practical, not easy things that um, could lead us into dealing with some of these offenses. Um, and I want to give you this um, just disclaimer that it's not by our determination that we're going to be able to walk through dealing with offenses. It's going to be by our cooperation with God. That's what makes this possible. Okay, first thing, y'all, we need to deal with offenses quickly. There's a short window that you can deal with offense before you create this entire soap opera that's three seasons long that you have developed and scripted all by yourself. She didn't say hi to me. What did I do? I, I think that maybe last time when I came, I was in a rush. She didn't say hi to me. She must be mad. Oh, goodness. I don't want to talk to her. If that's how she's going to be super high maintenance, I'm definitely not going to be her friend anymore. Y'all, we create this entire story in our head. And next time we see her, like, we want to make sure that's a fake hi because I want to make sure that you see me so you don't, like, give me a dirty look next time. And that person had no idea you were even there. Right? We create this entire story in our head. And when I say we deal with the offense quickly, it doesn't always mean we have to go up to that person. Sometimes it means you got to take it to God. Let him filter your heart. It says, purify my heart. That's what the word of God says in Psalms. You know the word purify, the word pure, actually comes from the word kath which means, you know, catheter, there's a good flow, a healthy flow. I mean, there's probably other people are like, ooh, you know, but, but y'all, it's for a reason, right? Make sure there's nothing that's clogging. It's a pure and healthy flow. That's what at least you're trying to get. So you're saying, God, you be that filter. You purify my heart. And there's a reason why God tells us to deal with it in a healthy way. And just a little side note for those of you who seem like maybe you, you feel like you're constantly feeling um, maybe in arguments. or Okay, here's what I learned through this series. Three minutes max is what you probably should be discussing any type of issue that could lead to something bigger. Three minutes. Three. Write it down. Write it down. Three minutes, you guys, before it gets unhealthy, because then you're just like talking about all these things that creates this big old monster. But sometimes offense happens like that in our head, right? Offense, we start creating all of these ideas of what we think and what we believe and what the enemy now is making us believe in our head. And we start creating these stories. And there's a reason why God tells us to deal with offense quickly in Matthew 24, 10. Check out what the word of God says. And we're going to, this is the scripture that we read um, earlier. Then many will take offense, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up, deceive many, because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will go, grow cold. Now, I want to break this verse down a little bit. Here's the thing. We get an offense. I'm offended about something. I'm not talking about it. I am just offended because I have a right to now be upset. You did something, and because you did it, I'm offended. It got me. I have the right to be this way. But here's the thing. When we don't deal with offense, it then turns into hate. Y'all, we can be having a whole lot of Jesus-loving people walking around with hate in their heart. When you don't deal with an offense, harbored, hate, harbored offense turns into hate. And then look at what it says. And then your hearts grow cold. It is impossible to love out of a cold heart. Now, here's the thing why this matters so much. John 13, 35 tells us this. By this, 
All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If the enemy can keep us trapped in a fence, now our hearts are cold. Now we begin to hate. It is impossible to love others. And the only proof we have that we love Jesus is gone. The only evidence of God's love in us is now gone. And we can no longer share who he is. That is the enemy's trap. That's the biggest picture. The offense, it's a small little tactic. The big picture is kingdom. The big picture is heaven. The big picture is leading others into God's love. But when your small little offense gets so big that it gets in the middle of it. Who's winning? It's not me. It's not you. And that's just it. We have to bring it to light because the minute we bring it to light, the enemy no longer has control. I know where this is coming from. I share with the girls. Um, y'all, if you're doing a, a, a venture group, will you make some noise? Okay. You guys venture group this, I mean, it has been fire gut checking, but fire. Right. And I shared with the girls, I used to hate it when Matthew would be like, babe, you got to stop. Like, this is like a spiritual battle, spiritual battle. Don't, I have things to say, like, don't cut me off right here yet. I got, I got things to say. Right. But it's the truth when we can bring it to like, how do you argue that? Let me now look at you through God's eyes, through God's filter. Let me look at this through God's filter. Now it's no longer you or you. It's this thing that the enemy has already started to stir, and we've started to fall into it. So I know that our heart is not to live with harbored offense. I know that our heart is not to uh, harbor offense to the point where it leads to hate. And then when it leads to lead others away from God because of what they see in us, but that's why it's a trap. That's why it's a trap. And I know that we don't want to live that way. So, so what now, right? What do we do? We know that we deal with it quickly, but okay, now what? I'm so glad you asked. This is where we're going to park a little bit longer. We deal with it quickly And the second thing is we have an intentional approach. Well, what's the intention? I'm glad you asked. Forgiveness. And many of you are like, like, I was so good up until you said forgiveness. Like, I'm, I'm good with like, okay, I know that I need to bring it to light. I know that like maybe the enemy's in the middle of it, but forgiveness? So we're going to park a little bit longer in this. I believe that a lot of the times we talk a lot about love and forgiveness, but not often told how. Like, how, how do I forgive? This is deep hurt. How do we forgive? So before we get there, I want to just start with some basics. Because why do we need to forgive to begin with? So you got to write this one down. I want you to understand this. Fundamental uh, Forgiveness is fundamental to our faith. Forgiveness is fundamental to our faith. Well, what do you mean by that? Fundamental, in order for you to even appreciate that statement, let alone take it to heart, you have to be able to appreciate what fundamentals are. Fundamentals are the basis of things, the foundation of things, of what we're going to be able to build upon. And let me make this practical for you, okay? Why fundamentals are important. So we, uh, during Olympics, our family got into watching Olympic volleyball. Man, those, like, women kill it. Like, it, it is rowdy. It's good. It's quick. It's awesome. And we got, you know, we were cheering, you know, teams on. And they're really good. A few weeks ago, my sixth grade daughter's volleyball season started, and I'm going to tell you, it looked a little bit different. (laughs) I mean, don't get me wrong, Chloe did awesome last, uh, yesterday, helped win her game, she did great, but a couple weeks ago, it was, it, it just looked a little bit different than what we were watching on TV. Granted, yes, I get it, I'm not trying to set these crazy standards at sixth grade volleyball. But y'all, there was fundamentals that they needed to take on. Like they're serving and it's like balls going like all over the place, right? Like they would get one serve in, the game would stop. We'd get all excited. Oh, no. Get all excited. Oh, no. Um, There were some fundamentals they needed to, to learn. Here's the thing. Sixth grade volleyball can look like sixth grade volleyball for a really long time if we don't get fundamentals down. 
you don't get to like Olympic level by like not getting the fundamentals down. You got to be able to serve the ball first. You got to be able to like know your positions first, be able to even know your team first before you even get to the next level. You might not even make it to tryouts when you get to middle school. So here's the thing, you got to get fundamentals down. And I want to make sure that we understand that there are some fundamentals to our faith that we have to own. You know, prayer, worship, generosity. We can say we love God without having some of these things under our belt as our foundation, but love and forgiveness must also be. Those are foundations as believers. And here's the thing, found, found fundamentals, anything that's foundation, it's not, it doesn't come naturally. It's something that we have to practice. It's something that we often have to correct even. And then we have to perfect. And we can only do that by continuously doing it. And you're not alone in thinking like, okay, so I was like good with this whole, I was good with the prayer thing and I was good with the worship thing and I was okay with the generosity thing. But when you got to the forgiveness thing, I, as I, I've started, maybe some of you have already started to think about some of the offenses that have risen to the surface as we've been talking about this. And you're realizing this forgiveness thing, I don't know. I want to remind you, I want to tell you through this, you are not alone in thinking that it's not easy. In Luke 17, check out the interaction. This is Jesus and the disciples, okay? These are people who are walking with Jesus. The disciples are like, so uh, they want to make sure they're clear. Like, so please explain to us. Make it real clear. How are we do we do this forgiveness thing? And here Jesus says, and if he sins against you seven times in the day, this is verse 4 of Luke 17, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And here's the disciples' response, okay? The disciples say, increase our faith. Like, if you're going to ask us to do that, we're going to need to up the faith game a little bit because I can't see me doing that where I'm at right now. And this is the disciples talking, standing, walking next to Jesus. See, Jesus makes it clear that we don't align to this world. There's got to be something that separates us from this world, and he makes it very clear. John 18, 36, Jesus answered. This is when, you know, they're, they're, they're going to take him to be crucified. But here Jesus is saying, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. See, he's saying if, if, this, if this were like earthly way, like someone would be like, hold me back. Hold me back, somebody. Like, we about to do this. Can you just imagine disciples? Like, hold me back. Hold me back. Hold me back, y'all. Like, we about to do this. Can you just imagine? But he's saying, no, that is not how I do things. That is not my kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. See, his eyes were still gazed forward despite of what he knew was coming to him. Now, I hope that we have an understanding of why fundamentals matter and that we're able to understand why uh, forgiveness is going to matter um, that much more. And I know that maybe still doesn't make it easier, but I want us to understand that in order for us to get past this, because again, it's a trap, right? You're going to find yourself here over and over. Forgiveness has to be our strategy. Forgiveness is our strategy. And some of you just passed out in your chair, heart palpitations, like, not trying to do all that. It, it, this, this is a hard thing. If you are having a hard time even grasping this concept, you might not have a clear revelation or a clear understanding of what forgiveness is. You might be thinking forgiveness is justice, but that is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is freedom. See, many of us are standing with this invisible trap around us. We have created this uh, uh, this fence around this invisible fence and we're thinking like oh yes I can't wait God send me and we're like oh but I can only go this far because I have this harbored offense within me oh here's a here's a man that God is sending my way and that is the guy that he has for me for the rest of my life but I'm only gonna go so far because now I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that he's gonna treat me like everybody else has and now I'm not giving that person all of who I am or who God has called me to be in this relationship there's a lot of things that are holding you back. Whatever is holding you back, you are sitting in a trap. And we don't even realize that, that forgiveness is the very thing that God designed to heal our hurting heart. 
That is the one thing he used to give us freedom. That is the one thing he did on that cross to give us freedom. He forgave you, forgave me far before we committed any sin, offense, or hurt towards him. Because the word of God says we hurt his heart. And even then, he chose forgiveness. And we must understand that, that if you're hurting, that if you're feeling some kind of offense that's spurred up, and maybe even right now, like, oh, my blood's boiling right now because I just brought up some things that I've been thinking about and haven't touched in a while. Forgiveness is the one thing that is God's gift to you to be able to bring healing to your hurting heart. And so we need to be able to identify what is it that the, okay, if, if forgiveness is our strategy, well, what's the enemy's? The enemy's agenda is destruction. We know the word of God says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His only job, has three descriptions in his job description. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. His strategy is division. Y'all, we don't, we, the first mention of the enemy, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the first mention we hear of him is in Genesis, yes, but not until it was Adam and Eve. His whole strategy, he wanted to create separation between them and God and separation between them too. That is the time where we see him come into play when he wants to come and cause division. That's his strategy, but his tactic, his bait, that is offense. When we begin to bring it to light, we're going to be able to identify that is not God. That is not even you, friend. That is not even you, husband. That is not even you, coworker. The enemy is trying to get in the middle of us too. And so because we know that, because we brought it to light, we can change the narrative. Now, this is where it's our choice. We get to flip the script if we want to. We get to change the narrative. I love this story. Um, His name is Roger Bannister, this man. Um, He was the first person to run the mile in four minutes. This was in 1952. He was the first person to run the mile in four minutes. This is the cool part. Only seven weeks later, somebody else did it. And then somebody else did it. And then somebody else did it. You know why? Because there was a new standard. There was something that somebody saw that is attainable. What if we chose to flip the script on what forgiveness looks like in our home, in in the places that we interact Some of you need to start now because holidays are coming. And if you have kids, you're going to get those eye rolls when you go shopping, right? So this is like, this is why we're bringing this now, because some of us are going to take a little bit longer to get there and understand that forgiveness is going to have to start taking place right now. Here's the thing. We have to be able to set a new standard and Jesus gave that to us. And that was forgiveness. And here's the awesome thing. He saw you fit. He saw me fit to carry it through. Where are we doing with it? How are we doing with it? He saw us fit to carry us through. He saw us fit to change that narrative. And we talk this song. We see, you know, cities in revival, right? We see, and sometimes we think that revival means miracles, signs, and wonders. And while all of that is true, revival is, what that means is a shift, a change for the better. Tell me we won't see revival in our homes. Tell me we won't see revival in our cities when we begin to just be gift freedom and grace and redemption to all the people around us when the expectation of our culture is simply to be offended, eventually hate, and like, you're canceled. Tell me we won't see a revival shift beginning within us, a hunger to say, I can't wait to give somebody a taste of what I've tasted. Tell me we won't see something shift within our hearts. Galatians 5, um, 7 and 8, uh, check out what it says, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. So I want to ask you, who cut in on you? Who cut in on you that kept you from keeping your eyes on Jesus? That kept you from seeing the forgiveness that's been given to you? Who cut in on you? that now is causing this hurt, that now that offense has turned into depression or anxiety, unforgiveness, anger, that you're not just giving towards that person, but it's a part of who you've become. 
Who cut in on you? Who kept you from keeping your eyes forward? We have to see it for what it is. The enemy wants to divide. The enemy wants your heart so cold that you cannot show people who he is. And I want to tell you right now, this isn't a house that's going to say, how dare you come in with offense and hold on to something? This is a house that wants to just bring you to awareness of God's love and grace and mercy for you, that if you can experience that and we can own it and we can live it, then we can give it. And God wants that for you. Mark eleven twenty two. 22, I love this scripture growing up. It says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but, believe, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. See, God wants to do all the verse uh, 22, 23, 24. He wants to do all those things. He wants to work in the supernatural. He works in the supernatural, but what he's asking us is like, son, daughter, can you just work in the natural? Can you just work in the things that are in front of you? And then I can handle the rest. He wants more for us. I know that there is real hurt. I know for some of us, it's been hurt that we've been harboring for a really long, long time. And I'm not saying that forgiveness for some of us is going to be an overnight thing. It's not. Forgiveness is a journey. And it's okay. And my encouragement is to you today that you would just choose to stand on the road where the journey begins towards forgiveness. Um, There was a couple of years ago where I took a really bad fall. Some of you were there. It was like, I think what started, like, now I fall often. Um, so I, I fell a, real, a pretty bad fall. And you know when you get up and you're like, oh, no, I'm good. No damage here. Um, what I didn't realize that actually it was, it was a farther worse fall than I f- felt at the moment. And I didn't go to the doctor until I realized, like, man, I'm getting really bad headaches now that I'm getting migraines. All of a sudden, I can't feel my right side. Like, there was a lot of things started happening, and I thought, maybe I should go to the doctor now. So I did, and the doctor's like, you're actually going to need physical therapy. You're going to have some medication you're going to have to do. And I remember going to physical therapy, and at first I was like, ooh, massage is okay. I'm good with this, and physical therapy. Okay, cool. Then I'm like, this is, a, this is taking my time. How long, I said, doctor, how long am I going to have to be doing this for? And he said, you see, if you would have come to me sooner, we probably wouldn't have this long of a journey to healing. But I'm going to say it's probably going to be about a year. And about a year it was. This is what I'm trying to tell you. You've probably been hurting for a long time. And that is okay. But let me tell you something. God did not create you to carry that burden, that hurt. He did not create you to carry it for this long. It's okay to feel. But he wants you to hand him over your offenses. And it's okay if it's not overnight for you. It's okay if this journey takes a little bit longer than the person next to you. You're on the journey. And when you invite God into it, here's the thing. When you invite God into any space, it's impossible for it not to change. It's impossible to not invite God into your hurting, into your mess, into the things where you need things to shift and him not do it. It's impossible for you to bring light into a dark place and it not light up. And God wants to do that for you today. So what if today we chose to just change the narrative on this forgiveness thing? Chose the narrative of what it looks like in our home. What if, y'all brace yourselves, okay? What if we chose to pray for that person that hurt you? What? Okay, y'all just went way too far, Venture. What if? See, it's impossible for God to not shift our heart when we bring him in the middle of the ugliest of messes. 
He redeems it all. His word says it. And here's the thing. If God is a God of forgiveness and he is our blueprint, we must follow that. It is a fundamental part of our faith. And it is impossible for him not to act where it feels like we can't. That is where he works the best. I'm going to close out here pretty soon, but I want to leave you with this, okay? Praying for those that you love, because we do that. Praying for those that you love, that's sincerity. But praying for those that hurt you, that's maturity. That's that fundamentals. We can get those fundamentals down and we can grow on that. See, when you can get to this place, I'm not saying you have to be here now, but man, ask God to help you. Like those disciples, man, increase my faith because I am tired. I am tired of feeling burdened by the offense. I'm tired of every time I get triggered, it's brought back. I'm tired. I'm tired of realizing now that I've actually been trapped and I haven't allowed other people in anymore. Haven't been the real self because I've been trapped. Proverbs 18, 19 says this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Proverbs 18, 19, an offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city, and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. When you have an offense, you have become so hard that nothing, it is so hard to penetrate who you are, to penetrate your heart, to penetrate the real you. You are inside of that hardened place. And that is why sometimes at funerals, man, there is such devastation because there is so much regret. And why I plead with you and encourage you, let it go. And if you can't let it go, let God in so that he can lead you into this forgiveness journey because he wants that for you. Proverbs 19 11, good sense makes one slow to anger. Check this out. And it is his glory. It's not talking about Jesus, it's talking about us. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. Y'all, when we overlook an offense, when we can say, like, it ain't you, I'm not going to let that go into my heart and penetrate and do all the things that the enemy wants me to fall trap of. No, when you can do that, you're walking in glory. And we're like, God, show us your glory. And God's like, show me your glory. He wants us to walk in that. He created us to walk free and light and enjoy life. He didn't create us to be prisoners. He died for that. So maybe today it's the start of something for you, simply to acknowledge it. Maybe that's your start, to acknowledge it, to say, uh, maybe yours yours is, is I've, I've known, and now I just need to let God in. Maybe you've realized the way I've been talking about my story, yeah, there's still some offense that I got to take part in, that I got to make sure I've released or that I acknowledge. Maybe for you, it's simply starting on this journey saying, I, I got st- to just get on the road with Jesus. I got to invite him into that space. Look, it's not, I don't mean I'm, I overlook it. I don't mean uh, don't uh, acknowledge it. I'm not even saying don't deal with it. But here's the thing. Offense is an event, but offended, that is a choice. You don't have to live offended. You can acknowledge, I've been hurt, but I am not going to choose to live in offense. I am not going to choose to harbor. And now I have that turn into, hey, I am not going to choose that. I was created for greater. Look, it may be like it feels hard. Maybe you wrote some things down and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to start. Maybe for you, your start today is simply to begin to shift your mind. And when you begin to feel like you can't, you can look to God's word and he tells you, no, but I can. When you can say, you know, sometimes we say it's too early. Now you're feeling it's too late. God says, I redeem all things. When you say, I'm definitely not strong because that offense, that was too hard. That was too deep. He says, but when you are weak, I am strong. You might have to begin to shift the narrative in your mind and not allow the enemy to dupe you with his lies when you can confront it with God's powerful truth. He's created us for more. He wants more. But in order to do that, we're going to have to realize there are some things that we have to be able to just 
kick and let go of and be able to move a little bit more free in order to do that, we got to invite God into our space. Because remember, it is not going to be by our doing. It's going to have to be by our cooperation, by our partnership with God.